Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, we see the Apostle John is, he's exiled to the island of Patmos. He's put there because he's been preaching Jesus. He's been telling people about Jesus, and he was seen as a threat. Now, we know that Jesus was seen as a threat to the religious people of the day. When Jesus came into the temple, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a little bit, is that when Jesus came to the temple, he really twisted up the religious people of the day. He really offended their way of life. We don't have a Jesus that Western culture has hanging on your grandma's wall. You know, I'm, the one that I'm talking about is the blue-eyed Fabio hair holding a lamb, petting a lamb, wimpy Jesus. That's not the Jesus that we have. In fact, we've got a Jesus that went into town and really hacked people off. Jesus didn't have an overwhelming following. In fact, last week we talked about how Everybody thinks that Palm Sunday is just, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fun Sunday to do little crafts and turn palm fronds into crosses and things like that. And that's all well and good. That's fine. But Jesus, when he went into Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem. He didn't just weep at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept over the people that were about to reject him. When he was at the tomb of Lazarus, he wasn't weeping because he had to call Lazarus out of the grave. He was weeping because there were going to be mounds of people that would witness a dead man come out of a grave, but yet they still would not believe. In fact, they would organize a group to crucify him. I'm talking about the same Jesus that when he went into Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19 that he wept over Jerusalem because he knew that the people that he was going in there to die for were going to reject him. And he wept. But it did not stop him from causing some havoc in the town. He was not intimidated by the size of the people that he was fixing to face. He was not moved by his opponent, the enemy of the world, Satan. Now listen, I, I know this is, this is going to be kind of tough. I get it. I understand it. But you know what? Jesus, when he went into Jerusalem, he said, we ain't got time to play games, y'all. We ain't got time to play games. And listen, if you follow any kind of current events that are going on in the world and all around the world, and I mentioned to you last week that God does not operate off the Gregorian calendar that we operate on. There is a God calendar. We, we always say it's a Jewish calendar, but it's really a God calendar. And the Jews are the only ones that are following it. In, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, in the, in the latter portion of it, it says, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That was Jesus talking to John. Earlier in that chapter, John was on the island of Patmos, and John saw Jesus face to face. And Jesus said, John, I want you to write down everything that you see and everything that you hear. And this is one of the things that John recorded. It says that when I turned to see who was speaking to me, so Jesus was speaking directly to John. And he said, he said, this is what I saw later on in verse 14. It says that his eyes were like flames of fire. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if I walked up into a room and I saw someone standing there and their eyes were flames of fire, I'd be a little freaked out. I, I would be a little intimidated. 
Kind of like standing in the ring with smoking Joe Frazier, knowing that he's about to smoke me. I mean, I would be intimidated by that. And he says here, his voice thundered like mighty, like a mighty ocean waves. And it says that he held the seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. Now, I'm not going to go into that teaching, but the sword is the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the two-edged sword. The Word of God was coming out of his mouth. To me, if I was standing in a room with that, I would be a little scared. Kind of like those majority of this room was scared of me in that little wording I gave you a while ago. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. Is we, we always hear these cute, wonderful stories, and those are good stories. I'm not, I'm not saying they're bad stories. But we always hear about, oh, how gentle, and G listen, J Jesus is gentle. He's gentle as a lamb. I get it. And I know this sounds contradictory. But I'm just telling you here today that we have a weak and a wimpy generation in the bride of Christ today. And it's been getting weaker after every generation. We've been getting further and further away from the things of God. And we see people, they have a focus of things that are more important than coming together as a body of Christ. Not to support the pastor, not to make sure that the church is funded, but to come together as the bride of Christ and to go into the throne room of God and to lay the things of the world at the altar of God and expect... God to do what only God can do. I'm telling you right now, we don't serve a wimpy, mamsy-pamsy Jesus. We've got, a, we've got a Jesus that is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has eyes of fire. His voice is like the mighty ocean waves. And he has a sword that protrudes out of his mouth, a double-edged sword, the Word of God. I want to begin when Jesus came out of the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. How many people know that Jesus is strong? Now, I don't know that he was a bodybuilder. I don't know that he looked like Joe Frazier. I don't know if he looked like Mr. T, Hulk Hogan. I don't know what, you know, I don't know if he was built like that. He probably wasn't. In fact, I, I don't think there was anything that would draw you to him. No, no nothing appearance-wise would draw you to him. But I'm going to tell you here today because he identifies himself as having all power and all authority. And I'm telling you right now, when someone with authority walks into the room, you stand to attention. But it's sad that we see so many churches all over that are filled with people that wouldn't even know if Jesus walked in the room. Because we have a whole different view of what he looks like and what he will do in your life if you'll let him. But in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had just spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness fasting. How many people have ever fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? That's a long time. That is a long time. Physically, Jesus was at his weakest physically he, he was he was broke down I'm telling you now if, if you go 40 days without food and I never have you know the longest I've gone with with just water I don't even probably three four days and 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 then I I, I convert over to uh, like a Daniel fast and by that time I'm I'm really cranky I'm really hangry 
Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights. So in the natural, in the physical, he, he wasn't like this. He was spiritually strong, but physically he was probably he was probably weak. He was hungry. He was famished. And we see him when the enemy comes up against him. His response to him in Matthew chapter 4 verse 10 was, Get out of here, Satan. I don't care how long I've gone without food. You have no authority over me. He didn't say, come on, come on, devil. I, I've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm hungry. No. One of the things that he told the enemy was that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The two-edged sword. Over in Matthew chapter 5, we see Jesus on his earthly ministry addressing the spiritual leaders of the day and he says I warn you unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven Jesus is kind of laying down a laying down a, a premises here because in their time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they were really into their traditions. They were really into following the law and, and, you know, trying to be good, so to speak. Jesus even made a statement to them and said that I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Man, it is absolutely impossible for man to hold up to the law of God. Because Jesus pointed out in his teaching that if you break even one, you are guilty of them all. But Jesus came as the sinless, blameless Lamb of God. He was tempted in all points, just like we are, yet without sin. So he tells these religious people that are really steeped in following tradition and following rules and regulations, unless your righteousness is better. I'm sure that was probably a slap in their face because in their, in their eyes, they were, they were good. They were doing what was right in everyone else was the ones that were wrong and the way they lived their life. They, they, felt, they felt encouraged by their own self-righteousness is what I'm saying. Over in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus goes after the rich, after those that put their trust in their riches. Jesus points out, he says in, in Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Jesus is not saying that you can't make money. Jesus is not saying that you can't make a lot of money. What Jesus is saying is, is money cannot be your God and God be your God at the same time. And we see so prevalently in, in today's society how we are constantly going for more. We've got to build up our stock options. We've got to build up our mutual funds. We've got to build up our 401k. We've got to build up our savings plan. We've got to work seven days a week so that we can get what we want. Jesus says, if money is your God, then I'm not. I've lived that life, and it is a dead-end road. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Like the Apostle Paul says, I've had much, and I've had little. 
And until I started putting God first and honoring God first, and that is in everything in my life, honoring God with my time, honoring God with the money that I make, honoring God with my talents. When I started putting God first, that is when I became successful. Jesus went after him. You cannot serve two masters. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 20, 22, he, he's talking about judgment day. And he says, I ain't playing around. I mean, it doesn't say that word for where I, I, I said that. He ain't playing around. But that's what I get from it. Because he said, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply to you, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. We find so many in the world today living just like that. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. And Jesus came after them. Listen, I, I, I can see y'all's faces. I, I'm looking at what y'all, I'm reading your minds right now. And y'all are like, I didn't come for this message. I didn't come for this message. I, I brought my family here to hear an uplifting message about Jesus, and he's the lamb, and he is the lamb. But I'm just telling you here that when Jesus went into Jerusalem and when Jesus was teaching, he didn't pull no punches. He didn't hold back. He went all Joe Frazier. He swung with everything. Why? Because eternity is real. Right. Hell is real. And a lot of people, like Charles used to always say, a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches because we've got it here, but you don't have it here. There's a lot of people that got Jesus in their mind, but they ain't got Jesus in their heart. They live like the devil Monday through Saturday, I mean, and, and, and try to put on some sort of a show on Sunday like I'm holy. This is the kind of teaching that Jesus was doing. Right. Why? Because he understands. Why? Because he is eternity. Not only is he the past, he's the present, and he's the future. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. And you might say, well, I thought God said that. Let me give you a little clue. He is God. Amen. He's God in the flesh. And he came to save his people. But his people spit in his face. That's why he wept over Jerusalem. That's why he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Because the people that he came to save rejected him because he didn't fit the bill. He swung too hard. You know how many times I've been told that? I don't come to your church because you are just, you're too loud. I don't come to your church because you're always telling us stuff like this. I don't want this to sound like some doomsday message, but it kind of really is what Jesus preached. Because he cares whether you go to hell or not. Amen. And I understand this is not popular preaching. You don't get this preaching at whimsy, mamsy, pamsy churches. And I'm not calling them out, and I'm not pointing them out. But what I am telling you is, is that your blood is on my hands, and I will not be held accountable for people that did say that they say, I didn't know, I didn't know. Because if you came to this church, you know. Amen. You know that there's a heaven and a hell, and you know that eternity is real. And you'll know that when you leave here, that if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you will spend eternity separated from him if you close your eyes on this earth right now. Amen. Jesus talks about this authority. In verse 28 of Matthew chapter 7, he says that when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. He taught with authority. Jesus had authority. What did he tell John in Revelation chapter 1? We've read it already. We started out with it in Revelation chapter 1. Don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid. I'm the one who died and who is alive now. Don't be afraid because I hold the keys to death in the grave. I went and I did what your religious leaders could not do. That's what Jesus was saying. I went and I did what your religious leaders cannot do. And I did it for the glory of the Father. He has authority. In, in Matthew chapter 8, we're, we're moving rapidly through the ministry of Jesus, aren't we? Probably not going to get done in 12 minutes, but it's okay. In Matthew chapter 8, we see, we see Jesus taking authority over the wind and the waves. Jesus was taking a nap at the bottom of the boat. And the disciples were freaking out over the storm. And Jesus, Jesus gets up and says, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And suddenly there was a great calm. And the disciples were amazed. Who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I mean, these dudes were with him every day, all day long. And they're like, who is this guy? Even the wind obeys his voice. Listen, the demons recognize Jesus' power in verse 28 of that same chapter of Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the of the Gadarenes, two men who were pe possessed by demons, they came out to the tombs who were who were so violent that they could, that no one could go through the area. And they began screaming at him, Jesus, they began screaming at Jesus, saying, Why are you interfering with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? The entire town came out to meet Jesus, and they begged him to go away and leave them alone. Kind of like what we're hearing in the world today. Don't tell me about that Jesus stuff. I don't want to hear about your Jesus stuff. Don't preach that Jesus stuff to me. I'm telling you, if we open our eyes to the reality of eternity and what is taking place in the world today, God's calendar is counting down rapidly. And I'm not here to put fear in you, and I'm not here to create some sort of an anxiety, but it's quite obvious that when Jesus was going around preaching, that he was preaching the same thing. That it is of utmost importance that you hear what I'm saying. This is what Jesus was telling them. In verse 32, he says, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven, but everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Look what he says in verse 37. He says, if you love your father or your mother more than you love me, you're not worthy to be mine. If you love your son or your daughter more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to be mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. He's not saying that you have to actually hate your mom and dad or hate your children. It all goes down to what is the priority in your life? What is most important to you? Is it God? Or is it your lifestyle? Or is it your family or your job? All those things are important. I believe all those things are important to God. But is He most important to you so that He can bless all of that that is important to you? Because when He is most important to you, the things that are important to you become important to God. And if we'll put God first, then he will bless what your hand is put to. In Matthew chapter 15, the disciples came to Jesus. In verse, in verse 12, 
the disciples came to him and, and says, do you realize that you have offended the Pharisees by what you have said? The disciples told Jesus, you've offended them by your words. Jesus said, I'm so sorry. Can we send out a retraction? Can, can we make a post on X and say, I didn't mean to say that. It came out wrong. Maybe we should release a statement so that the world knows that I'm not mean. I can't tell you how many people have told me you're too mean. Not just my kids, but people that have left New Covenant to go somewhere else. You're too mean. You, 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 don't, you don't have any compassion on being real. And I'm telling you the reality of hell. And I'm telling you how much Jesus cares about you. And if that means you think that I'm mean, if I get souls out of hell and get you lined up on the narrow path, then I'll sign up for meanness. You can call me meanie. I'll be meanie. I'm okay. I've got pretty thick skin. And I'm pretty sure Jesus had some pretty thick skin too. Because Jesus wouldn't have been going around telling people the things that he was telling them if he couldn't handle it. And I'm pretty sure that when the disciples said, Jesus, don't you know that you've offended them? I don't think he said, I'm sorry, guys, we shouldn't have done that. Let's go back and make, make, let's make better. Jesus replied, every plant not planted by my heavenly Father is going to be uprooted. Not that Jesus was trying to be mean to them, but Jesus was trying to get them out of hell and into heaven. He says they are blind guides leading the blind. If one blind person guides another one, they'll both fall into a ditch. Don't sound like Fabio Jesus to me. It sounds to me like Jesus loved the people that he came for, which, by the way, is you. I know the word says that Jesus came to his own. I know Jesus is Jew. I know that that's what he came for. But the way that it, the door was open for you and me was because they rejected him. So that he could die for the entire world. This is what took place on Friday. He died for the entire world. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he reminds us that hell has absolutely no power over us. Can I get an amen? amen. He says in verse 17, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because your Father in heaven has revealed this to you. In other words, who Jesus is. <laughs> Jesus asked John, he says, he says uh, I mean, uh, Jesus asked Simon Peter, he says, uh, who, who do you say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, you're the Lord, you're, you're, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, man didn't reveal that to you, my Father in heaven did. He said, you didn't learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Let me tell you something. You are the church, the bride of Christ, and if you receive Christ as your Savior, no force of hell can conquer you. Look what he says. He says, I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying that they can't. He's saying it's very hard. He said, I'll say it again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because money is their God. And Jesus, when he was talking to the rich man, he said, go sell everything you have. Give everything you've got to the poor. Give it all away. And then come follow me. But he couldn't do it. 
He couldn't do it because all of his hope, his dreams, his aspirations were all tied up in his money. He refused to give his money up. I'm just telling you here today that when you put him first, he blesses what you've got. Matthew chapter 20. He's telling them about the kind of torture that he's about to be enduring. He says in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 18, he says, listen, he said, we are going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. They will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, to be flogged with a whip and crucified. But on the third day he will raise, be raised from the dead. Amen. That's what he did. That's what he did. They made, a, they made a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. And then they beat him and they beat his head where it was driving those, those thorns deeper and deeper into his skull. They spit on him. They mocked him. They whipped him. He fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah said that he was going to do all these things on our behalf. That he was going to go through these things for our redemption. In verse 28 of Matthew chapter 20, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Many people want to rise to fame. They want to rise to notoriety so that they can be served. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I come to serve you. I come to serve you and I come to die for you. We pick up where we left off last week and this is at Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21. He's coming in for the final time into Jerusalem. But what does he find? He finds a house that is filled with iniquity. And it says in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12, and if you look, if you, if you bring John chapter 2 together with this, he makes a whip, he creates a whip, but in, in, in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12, it says that Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for his sacrifice. He knocked over the money, the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those that were selling doves. And he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Matthew chapter 21, verse 42, he talks about he was the, he was the stone that was rejected. It says that, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? Boy, how many times have I heard that? I have never heard that before, Pastor. I've never heard that scripture before. Jesus said the same thing. He says, haven't you ever read this in the scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone? He said, this is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. He said, Jesus was saying, he's the cornerstone. He says, I'm the cornerstone he says, if you follow me, you're going, to be, you're going to be shattered. He said, but if I fall on you, I'm going to crush you. Man, again, I'm just saying, does this sound like some pet the lamb kind of? Listen, I, I know, I know, again, I'm going to remind you of what I said a moment ago. I know you're saying in your mind, I didn't come to hear this stuff. I didn't come to hear it like this. But this is the reality of the Jesus that we serve. That these are the things that were going on in their day, and there's the things that are going on today in the church. And I'm telling you, he's fed up with it. He's fed up with it. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you are yourselves. That's some pretty harsh words from Jesus. 
verse 25, he says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you're so careful to clean your outside of your cup and the dish, but inside it is filthy. Full of greed and self-indulgence, you blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits in verse 27, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you're hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, you're beautiful on the outside, but you're filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like religious people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's pretty tough. That is some pretty tough teaching and preaching. You look good on the outside. You, you sound good. Your worship sounds awesome but you're full of death on the inside because it's a farce. It's not real. Th this is what Jesus is saying. I'm not Jesus. I didn't write this. I'm only delivering you the message today. But this is a message that most steer away from because this is the reality of choosing sin over life. Right. He said you're full of dead you look good on the outside, but you're dead inside. He tells us, he says, you need to stay awake in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42, he says, so you too must keep watch. You, gotta keep, you, gotta, you need to be vigilant. You need to stay awake. Stay alert. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming back. In Matthew chapter 27, we see in verse 28... And when Jesus was heading to the cross, he was headed to be crucified. It says that they stripped him. They stripped him of his clothing and they put a scarlet robe on him and they wove thorn branches into a crown and they put it on his head and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter and they knelt before him in mockery and taunted him. Hell, king of the Jews. They spit on him. They grabbed the stick and then they struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they, they stripped that robe off of him and they put his clothes back on him again and they led him away to be crucified. He endured those things for you and for me. And on Friday, the world calls it Good Friday. But it is the day that Jesus was on the cross, and on that day, all of these things were weighing heavy on him because he loved you and me so much that he gave himself as the sacrifice. Why did he weep over Jerusalem? Because last Sunday, Palm Sunday, I told you and I shared with those that were here that it is the day that God commanded Israel to select the lamb. It was lamb selection day, the day that the lamb was to be selected for the Passover sacrifice. Jesus wept because he was not their chosen lamb, but he was the lamb that God chose. Over 2,000 years ago, that lamb the man Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, hung on a cross between two thieves. And he hung there for you and me so that we could experience life, so that we could have life. And all of the things that I spoke to you today he was warning not just the people of that day, but he's warning you and me not to be like the hypocrites. And he hung on that cross. And the scripture says that not a bone was broken in his body. And it was Roman custom that when they got tired of watching people be crucified, because that was a Roman thing, that wasn't a Jewish thing. 
crucifixion was part of their culture. Part of their culture was that when they got tired of watching you die because it was a slow, agonizing death, it, it, was a, it was a suffocation is what it was because your body weight crushed your lungs and slowly you were suffocated. That's beside the pain that you were in. And it says that at 3 p.m. on that day, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. <laughs> That's how much he loved you and me. Is that over 2,000 years ago, he was hanging on a cross, and he knew you by name. Because according to Jeremiah, it says that before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, he knew you, and he appointed a time for you. He knew everything that you were going to endure in your life. He knew everything that you were going to desire. He knew your life from beginning to end. He knew all the trouble you were going to be in in your life, and he still died for you anyway. The scripture says that he gave up his, his spirit. He said, it is finished. The work that I came here to do is done. It's over. It's finished. And he gave up his life. And the Roman soldiers went up there to break his legs. But they saw that he was already dead. He broke the legs of the guys beside him. But they never touched him except for the spear that they drove into his side. Still fulfillment of prophecy. Thousands of years ago, prophecy spoken about Jesus that was going to come. And he was going to come into a world that despised him. He was going to endure the shame on our behalf. And his blood was going to be shed so that it could be poured out on the mercy seat of God. So that it could atone for sin. One sacrifice, one time for all mankind. Never to be done again. On resurrection day in Matthew chapter 28 says in verse 5, the angel spoke to the woman that had come to the, to the tomb. This was Mary. Don't be afraid, he said. Don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here because he is risen. He is risen from the dead just as he said it would happen. He is risen. And then we see Jesus speaking to the disciples at the very end. After he walked the earth with hundreds of other people, religious people, not just religious people, men and women of God that came out of the grave with him to testify. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah. He is risen. And Jesus tells them just as he's about to ascend I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth therefore go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit he says teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you and be sure of this I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I remind you of what John witnessed in Revelation when he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Jesus appeared to John in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, don't be afraid, John. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Jesus is not someone to be afraid of, to be scared of. He's someone to be honored. When the scripture tells us to fear God, he 
He's saying, honor him, reverence him, show him glory. Don't be scared, curled up in a corner and afraid of what God will do to you. I know that's what it sounded like a lot of the times, but Jesus is saying, I took care of every bit of that for you. I endured every bit of what I told you about. I endured it on your behalf so that you don't have to experience it. All you have to do is receive me. Are you 100% sure that you will spend eternity with Jesus? Are you 100% sure that if today was your last day on this earth, that you will spend eternity with him? Or will you be one of the ones that say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. It's as simple as receiving the free gift that he has for us. Scripture tells us in Romans that all have sinned, everyone, no one is exempt, including this preacher, no one is exempt, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're like the religious people. We can look good on the outside, but that's as far as it goes. We cannot do what Jesus did. That's why he came. He is the sacrifice says the wages of sin is death. He's talking about spiritual separation. But the free gift of God is eternal life. The apostle wrote in 1 John 5, 13, he said, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm, t I'm just here to tell you today that the scripture reveals to us and the spirit of God will confirm in you. It says that his spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. You can know is what I'm telling you. You can walk out of this place today and say, yes, I know that if I'm not to live anymore, that I will spend eternity with him. That is his heart. That is his heart. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that I would that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. It is the heart of God that every single person on the planet would receive Jesus as their Savior. From that moment on, from saying yes, you give yourself over as a disciple. In other words, a learner, a follower of Christ. You follow him. You learn. You grow as a child of God. You grow as a family of God where we can grow together, pray together, lift one another up, trust God together. Amen.